Um, we're gonna we're recording it, so please feel free to have your camera off uh, if you prefer it. Uh, the plan for today is to explore teaching and learning strategies, which are going to develop reflective practice for your students with a focus on the progression of learning and improved outcomes. So we're going to explore element nine in particular, reflective practice, analyze how reflective practice models can be used to encourage students to feel part of the learning cycle rather than it done to them, take increased ownership of their learning and be more self-aware. We do have the opportunity today planned for you to work with each other. So team up and draw on the expect expertise and support of others to encourage engagement and innovation as part of your own reflective practice. I would also like you to ask questions related to the session as we go. Please put them in the chat as they come to mind and we'll we'll stop every so often to run through them um, and check at the end of the session that we've answered all of them. And we're going to explore how teachers can develop the students' academic skills as well today by reviewing the conventions of academic reading and writing and discuss some teaching and learn activities that can help you with that. OK, we'll do some introductions now. Janet, over to yourself. Hello, sorry, struggling to get off mute there. Hello, Helen. Hello, everybody. So my name is Janet King. I'm the sector manager for education and childcare here at NCFE. Great to be part of the session. Thanks, Helen. Lovely. Thank you. And I'm Helen Scanlon. For anybody who hasn't met me, I'm part of the provider development team, too. And our purpose is to support the teaching and learning of the technical qualification. I'd like to say hello to anyone I've not met before. I've been in and out of education and early years. Um, in, in recent years. Um, but welcome to everybody who's taken the time out of a very busy schedule to, to join us today. So thank you. So the first thing we're going to do is to share the outcomes of the session, which you can see on the screen now. Uh, we'll need you to remember to the, to the importance of being objective when carrying out reflection. It can be difficult for students to analyse and review their own practice. Conversations that Janet and I have regularly with providers is how mature students need to be to apply this professional reflective practice uh, and promoting objectivity is really important but we are going to include some activities which will allow you to share best practice experiences and ideas for both of today's subjects and we'll also be sharing some of our own ideas for you to evaluate adapt and use with your students so to start that off we're going to start off with a poll so just bear with me a second while i launch it and uh, we're asking you the no in the normal way on a scale of one to ten, one being low and ten being high. How confident do you feel teaching the topic of reflection? So you should see that on the screen now to to place your votes. I'm going to give you a minute or so just to pop how you're feeling. One being low, ten being high. Um, where are you with teaching the topic of reflection, please? So lovely, I can see people are starting to pop their scores in. It is anonymous, so please don't worry that if you put it low or high that you'll be named and shamed, you won't. It's anonymous, so please uh, pop your ideas in into that poll for us. Janet, how do you feel about the subject of teaching reflection? I think teaching the theory side of it and sort of looking at those models and it is what it is and you, you you learn those theoretical models and how to apply it with an example is pretty straightforward. But when it comes to that genuine um, sort of understanding of reflection, I think it can be a little bit difficult for 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 students and especially younger students going into placement perhaps or reflecting you've got to be you've got to be kind of raw and open and honest sometimes to to reflect so i think it could be quite difficult um to actually achieve proper reflection yeah absolutely totally agreed okay i'm going to close the poll now generally people are around the middle so thank you for that um probably where we'd expect there's a bit of a um a mix but uh, lovely thank you thank you for sharing that because refractive practice may be a more familiar topic in our subject area academic skills not so much but we'll come to those later and we'll look at them separately hopefully today's session is going to be structured in a way that will allow you to share your ideas experience and approaches as like we've said but we'll also have some activities um from our perspective to give you some ideas how to develop your students um, skills confidence and practice okay so the first question we're going to ask is for you to consider what reflection is in a professional context. 
I'm going to I'm going to launch a word cloud next. Uh, and what, what I'm going to ask you to do is put words into it which you feel relate to reflective practice. What words do you think of when you think about reflective practice? So I'm going to launch the the word cloud. Um, Janet, you can put words in there as well, and so will I, just so that we can get the ball rolling. Um, I mean, words that we've already mentioned today as well. Um, lovely, thank you for putting your words in so far. There's a good range of positive words coming in here as well. So I'm going to say thank you for that. We will share these words afterwards. I'm just trying to think of any other words that I might use. And this could be something you could do with your students as well yourselves. You could ask your students to pop in words there that you could pull apart and review. Um, in time. Some really good ones coming in there. I like the impact of actions. It's the, the, the review of what are you doing, what works and what doesn't. Um, I wonder what words your students would come up with if we asked, if you asked those. Um, if you ask the same question of, of, of your students. I'll just give it a little bit longer before I close it. OK, I'm going to close it shortly. So if you've got any more words, please pop them in and I'll close. OK, and I will, I'll close the poll now. I will share those with everybody afterwards as well. We've got a few documents and um, resources that we're going to share afterwards. So thank you for that. OK, here's a definition then for you to get us started. Um, are the words that we've already mentioned in our word cloud showing up here at all. The important terms seem to be review and practice with criticality, realism and using constructive approaches to inform your review. And this review then leads to some sort of action, making changes which will improve practice or maintain motivation. And these would be towards specific goals. And Reflective practice, we feel, does require the professional to be objective. I've come back to that word again, to explore what they do, review all aspects of the work and how they can maintain or improve the standards within the context. OK, so let's start exploring how it's structured. We'll share a high level overview of the steps or stages of reflective practice. And while we're running through this, please consider how or could you or how do you currently engage your students in this subject in the best way? Please have element nine in your mind as you're thinking about this to make the links that you can between what we say and how it relates to the qualification spec for this topic. Uh, and as you can see, our high level overview starts with carrying out some kind of activity. It includes normal everyday tasks, but also different or specific or new tasks. It's vital to get the students to review how the tasks are approached or carried out, including their own personal values, standards, and the expectations set both by themselves, but also possibly their colleagues. And then they would ref reflect on what they've done, what went well, what didn't go so well, what were the factors that impacted on how well it went and how did their approach impact on its success while also considering the involvement or any involvement or lack of involvement of, of others. Students again need to be objective, take a step back, look at what happens from the outside. Imagine they're an onlooker not involved personally in evaluating what happened and why it happened. They might also ask for the input of others 
the professionals they work with or even their peers or fellow students or workplace mentors, you know, get them to talk to their industry placement colleagues as well, get their input. Because if you can get the perspective of others around them, it gives them a broader sense of, of what happened and why it happened. Encourage your students to really think about who they might involve uh, and ensure they gain input and feedback from the most relevant people, even those who might be difficult to ask. So then they're going to use the findings and reflections and evaluations to inform that plan of action. Useful questions to pose here could be what might or will they do to address any issues? Will they change something or keep doing things the way they were? Because that's all part and parcel of reflection as well. They should have personal justifications for what they choose. If they're not going to change, why is it so? They bring an evaluation. For areas that will change, what's informed the changes? Why have they chosen the changes they have? They need to think carefully and objectively for this to get the best and most positive impact. And if they've received ideas from others, again, encourage them to be objective. Make a professional judgment on whether they're going to try them out or not and why. It can be really difficult for students to critically review their own practice, but also take criticism from others. But encouraging them to use an objective professional approach can really help them make informed choices, which will make them maintain high standards or improve or develop any areas that they need to. And this approach can help the students to improve their self-awareness, something we want to talk about today. Identify their own strengths and weaknesses, develop new skills and knowledge and improve, improve sorry, their decision making skills. So they've reflected on the practice. The next stage after they've made the plan would be to put that plan in action. It's important to review the changes and their impact whilst also reviewing any areas which remain unchanged and of course keep monitoring how well they're going. Again, involving others might be useful here. And then finally, carry out that a review of the whole process once, it, once it's done. Probably with some more long term planning of action here then this final review might be something more formal, for example, a one to one with a manager or a teacher, or it might be something that they keep to themselves. But the stages or steps could be seen to overlap or even be more recurring. It's important to acknowledge here that reflective practice is a very much an ongoing process, not necessarily with a start and end point that the most successful professionals embed this into everything they do. Janet, I'm going to ask you to add anything specific here before we look at the spec in more detail, please. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about education and reflection and the fact that we have to change everything that we do all of the time, it's a, it's a very, very ever changing, evolving landscape. So working in education in early years is actually accepting that it's a fast moving uh, and evolving landscape and those changes come from policy um, policy and impact from research is constant and trying to stay up to date and informed is challenging at the best of times I think and um, making so so is making decisions about what works in our own practice and why we change how we do things based on what we know so we have a thirst I think in education for making things better and it's natural for for early years educational um, educationalists it's equally important to find a place for reflection in our practice because I think all too often we're very busy this change is happening we're caught up in in this whirlwind but actually if we can find just a little bit of time to stop and reflect we can see can't we um how things might be done differently we can have time to listen to each other and and, and we're, we're able to make those improvements that you talked about Helen so we'll be able to explore this a little bit further throughout the session today and how to motivate students in this important Important feature of professional practice. Brilliant, thank you, Janet. It's insightful as always. So brilliant, thank you. And I've just put a reminder to everybody to put things into the chat um, as they as they come to mind or as they um, as as they pop into your head, kind of thing. So, okay, let's have a look at what the the TQ spec says that the students have got to understand for element nine and. You can see it on the screen now. We've we're going to have an activity shortly, which will ask you to share teaching and learning activities with each other via a Jamboard activity. So to start this off and get you thinking about it, please consider what you currently do or could do to increase student ownership of reflecting on their own practice. 
to make them feel more involved in developing their metacognition um, or thinking about their own learning and development. So it's a, it's not not so much a focus on what we do, it's what they do and how we can structure what we do as teachers to get them more involved and develop those areas. So thinking about how to engage students in understanding the key concepts and of the models of reflection, what the current priorities and debates are in education, how important and useful ongoing developmental feedback can be, and how can they identify and meet their own developmental needs. We're going to ask you to use a link we'll put into the chat um, to go to the Jamboard and share your current approaches and future activities. So just let give me a second, I'm going to copy that link into the chat for you to please access the Jamboard activity and share your ideas. That's why you're doing that, Helen. I think when we think about reflection and bringing it on board to something that the students um, can do, I don't think we always give credit for reflection when we might be asking questions, like when we might be doing discussions and group work. We don't necessarily use those terms, but what we're asking them to do is reflect on something, to stop and to think about something and where they can see where things might have gone wrong and why and, and, and what's being done or could be done to improve them. So it's terminology as well, isn't it? It is. It absolutely is. So the um, the, the, the link to the Jamboard should be in the chat now. Um, it should look like this. So we're going to be starting on page one. Please add sticky notes. And, and you'll use, do that using the control panel. It's on the left hand side of your screen. We've added a few ideas to get you started. So um, please click the link, let us know if you have any problems. If you'd like to take yourself off mute for a chat about what we're doing, that would be wonderful. Um, we just want to share best practice and experience in a more informal way. So what I'm going to do is get the jam board. A lot of people are on it already wonderful. So I'm just going to bring it over to this screen. Um, and as I say, please take yourself off chat, off chat, off mute, uh, if you'd like to, to share anything in particular. Um, Janet, we can talk about these as they come in and, and also encourage um, the chat from everybody. So, yeah. Oh, I like that one that's just coming in there, looking at the model. So looking at those different theoretical models I'm taking from that and thinking about how can I actually apply that? to my own experiences. So how can the students bring in their placement experience and make it real rather than just a conceptual theoretical thing over there? So yeah, lovely. Yeah, experiential learning massive and putting that learning and that theory into practice in, in placement or in the industry is going to make it come to life. And we yeah. talk a lot about making learning come into life, don't we? Um, you've got your you've got one normal matching you know what I'm like for my matching activities. I love a good old discussion, safe discussion about moving things around. So it, that would be something more like at the start of introducing the models to them as you go through that, you know, go through the reflective process and, and the develop the knowledge of um, reflective models. You can do more in-depth discussions and, and evaluations about it. So, yeah, using using templates, if you like, using the structure mm. and format of a model to help them to reflect on other areas of the curriculum, but also putting things into practice, another good one. Um, and revision booklets and displays. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Let's see if anybody wants These to come off, great, chat, off, off mute, please do. Yeah, if anybody actually, you know, how, how they might teach this through an innovative way or to make it come alive, obviously, we, we've seen some really good ideas there. But if people want to to talk about that, you know, that's that's great. And when we think about element element nine and the fact that, you know, this is linked in with with, with other things and, and debates and so on, um, you can see why that might be. Um, so anything that actually makes you look at where you are now and think and plan for where you want to be. And that, that could be something career wise personal wise there's so many things you could apply that with and case studies are always good I think as well for this kind of thing. Absolutely so we do have two pages you'll find on page two we've got 
the other two criteria from from element nine. So as things um, come to come to mind, please pop them in all all four of those uh, in relation to the four different areas that element nine includes. We've got lots of debates um, and reviews here going on, which is wonderful. You can't you can't go wrong with with education, can you? At the moment, there is the you, you could debate um, something different probably um, every day of the week. For, well, every day of the month probably at the moment because every hour so, of the day probably. <laughs> so yeah, probably there's so much going on, and there's I think some dimension change is one of the words before and. And, and reflection often comes when there is change, isn't it? Because that's when you stop and think and go, where did that, where did that come from? <laughs> and what, what am I going to have to do to be able to incorporate that in, into my lesson, into my um, scheme of work? So when things change in the, in, in the qualification itself, that was a time for reflection. OK, let's get our head around this. So that, that reflection um, that comes into that and then being able to enthuse those kind of feelings about new learning um, to the to the students. Consolidation is reflection for students as, as well when they try and bring all of these things together and make sense of them. Absolutely. So I'm just going to I'm just in the in the chat. Um, we've got Sarah's having problem connecting to the jam boards. So I've said uh, if need be, pop your ideas here and we can put them onto the, the jam board for you. Just want to capture every Everybody's input and ideas. Yes. We'll just go to the second page and we'll talk about these a little bit. Importance of developing, or sorry, receiving ongoing developmental feedback. It's very hard for a 15, 16, 17 year old to take feedback, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. oh, Sarah's in now. Great. Wonderful. No, that's good. Um, it really is because it's all about that that trust isn't it and I just think as you as you get older as you as, as you get you know the empathy and the trust is, is apparent in the job role that you do when you make those connections but I think at 16 it's very hard to to actually expose anything you're thinking with, without that fear of I got this right is is, uh, is anybody going to laugh at this is everybody going to think this is silly um and so it's, there's a certain level of maturity that comes with reflection and building building that trust. OK, thank you, Francis. No worries. Um, <laughs> when I when I put the consequences game on it, it, it made me think about instead of so feedback. So when I was in, in teacher education, feedback from a provider or mentor was that the, the trainee teacher was struggling with a certain aspect and they were finding it really hard to talk to them about it because they weren't being very reflective and they were really taking it personally. So I brought into the my session, my teaching session, um, a bit of it. It was kind of a, a consequences game, but was based on a based on a case study. And the case study was, you know, the, the the subject area that I knew one of the the class members was having problems with. And it was a case of they reviewed what was going wrong in this case study when actually it was about themselves, and they had that epiphany by pretending <laughs> it was someone else and not themselves. So sometimes you need to de detract dis get them out of that situation for them to be able to be reflective and how to receive feedback and how to develop mm. themselves. They had to do it by pretend, pretending it was someone else, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is one strategy, isn't it? And I think with the ESP and the the need to actually give give feedback and be constructive in that and to to be trusting and, and to take feedback in good spirit and to know how to give constructive feedback and um it's a skill, I think. Um, so it, it, it requires some, a level of maturity and also just a level of, of, of empathy, maybe a, as well. Um, and be, being having the, those skills and techniques to do it is something that that doesn't naturally um, for necessarily happen. No, especially in a, in a 16 year old. So it's hard. It's really mm. it's really a hard thing. Absolutely. So practicing giving that feedback, um, I think, is is important. Absolutely, and I mean, there are so many links when you when you see the core elements here to um, what they will actually be doing themselves as 
as professionals in the industry mm. you know what is the best way to learn a debate about how what's the best way to learn well you know that's so so different for absolutely every individual so so many different things you can do to bring in these different concepts and theories both for themselves as learners to develop their metacognition but also for the children and young people that they're working with as well it's a bit of a a dual thing mm. isn't it mm. yeah definitely I'm just looking at um, what's in the chat there. Yeah. So we've been trying to build good relationships between them. This is about giving giving feedback so they're comfortable with others in the classroom and happy to give and receive. It's so, so important, that, isn't it? It's all about connections. We were talking about this the other day, Helen, ourselves, weren't we? And about that criticality of, of having the trust and, and that connection and knowing that's what binds us. It's almost that... I would say that pastoral side of what you all provide for your students and, and in this day and age that is has always been critical but I think it's even more critically important now for, for students to to feel that um to feel that camaraderie if you like um, and being being able to to build that trust and feel safe and comfortable. Mm. Um yeah. And it's hard for 16 year olds because yeah, we, we all express ourselves in many different ways. And I think an anxious 16-year-old um, can express themselves in so many wonderful, um, wonderful ways. So, yeah, keeping all that on track is is no mean feat. Absolutely. OK, we're going to be um, sharing some of our own ideas now that Janet and I came up with before we started. But I'm going to be moving back to the PowerPoint. If you're on the jam board, you can have a look at what we're talking about by following the next few pages, because what I'm going to show you now are on the the next pages of the jam board so the first page looks a bit like this uh, it's got a few different ideas on them and we've also got these as word documents um, we're happy to share them um, for you to use and adapt after after today's session if you're going to find them useful so on this slide this the first is an example um, of a case study so on the top left hand corner here case study um, with a range of tasks on based on a very short case study to explore the, the area of professional development. The second is a checklist, and that's the one at the bottom here, and that's asking the students to rate different professional development activities, exploring some learning methods and asking some for ideas related to their worth and justifications for their choice. So getting the students to evaluate these, how useful are they in, a, you know, in rating one to five, whatever. Um, and then they can discuss them and compare them with their peers, doing the evaluation individually and then sharing uh, in, in pairs and in the larger group. And then this final example is a very short crossword puzzle on reflection very simply done on the discoverypuzzlemaker.com website and it's possible starter or plenary activity uh, and the link to the website create your own puzzles is at the top there if you don't already use them um the next sorry that was all the pages uh, the next page has a range of card sorting activities based on reflective models um included in element nine um you know what i'm like card activities can provide such a safe environment for students to explore the knowledge and understanding of any topic. And it can be easily di differentiated and meet the needs of a variety of preferred learning styles. So that middle example, the two sets of green cards, um, the, the, those relate to Gibbs's reflective model. And the first set has numbers of the stages on them, but the second one doesn't. So depending upon when used, teachers could use this approach or use, use the approach that suits the progress and knowledge level of the students at that time. And you can build all sorts of reusable and therefore sustainable activities based on having the cards set out like that. Um, and it's just the activity that they do uh, is different. Jana, can I bring you in here for anything extra before I move on to the next page? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love all of these activities that we've got. And um, what I will do, I don't know if people are aware as well 
of the um, education and childcare careers toolkit that we have um, at NCFE, and there's got there's, there's some wonderful things on there that actually um, there's some podcasts on. They explore some of those um, ideas in debates in contemporary issues. So these are ways of maybe listening to a little video clip or listening to um, to to people talking about a particular subject area and then reflecting on it and thinking about it. So you're using something visual um, as well as as an alternative. And also I can't I can't not tell you about the student conferences. So if you if you haven't heard of those, there's a link on that careers toolkit page as well. Um, and if you just put in education and childcare toolkit NCFE, it will come up and the student conferences are very they're all virtual. And they also are based on topic areas that will bring in aspects of reflection from employers, from HEIs, from students themselves with student voice. So again, that idea of do we agree with 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 what that um, with what that man was talking to us about? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Maybe we've got a different view. And I think all of that as well is is building up that that reflection and being able to offer feedback in a safe place and learning about giving constructive feedback to somebody else is also another good way of introducing it. Definitely. If you get the chance, Chani, would you pop the link to the learn at the the toolkit yeah. into the into the chat and I'll talk about the next example yeah, that we've got here. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So when we carried out some research on this topic, we came across a paper related to the characteristics of constructive feedback. And using this document, teachers could set questions for individuals or groups to answer or ask the group to set questions for each other to answer. And uh, there are some interesting points made in it using vocabulary, which the students might not be familiar with. And for the general English competencies, there's even the opportunity to spot spelling mistakes, um, which is the American English that's used in it, but also grammatical errors, who knew? Um, this could be therefore used in a number of ways, depending on the needs and levels of your students. And as we're near the end of the first section of this session, we're going to start moving into the subject of analysing academic skills. But not quite yet. But with this in mind, another way in which that last document that I just showed you there could be uh, used and adapted is to create a gap fill exercise, which is what this is an example of, where keywords are removed from the text, uh, but then shared separately. And the students are asked to put the words into the correct sentences. So they have to fill in the blanks using the words that are, are in this box here in the top left. Um, this type of activity is used by English teachers and can be easily adapted and used in, in technical learning. But before we move on, Jan, I'm going to come to you for your final thoughts on how to engage students in Element 9 learners. Anything we haven't mentioned yet? So much that we have mentioned. I think when just unpicking the word, and I think if you think of reflect, it's that mirror image. So it's being open, it's being honest, it's looking at yourself and what do you see and where do you want to be? Um, and that can be introduced through those wonderful activities that, that you've mentioned today, Helen, but also through, I mean, I know you've mentioned case studies, but using those case studies and taking somebody on a journey and being able to perhaps see them and look at how do they reflect to you? What do you see when you read about them and you get to know that person? And then people, you know, begin to think, OK, what do what do I see? Who am I? Where am I going? What what do I want to do? And it's that serious taking stock, that serious time to to think. So it can be so, so difficult um, to to know what you want to do and to know where you're going and, and so on. But I think reflecting even on where you are, somebody talked about different learning and, and the way that we, we approach teaching and learning and just thinking about what works for them and why some things don't work for them. And maybe it's because you just don't think they will and you haven't tried them. So there's there's lots of things, I think, that that we can do. But I think the activities just to try and understand reflection and not just make it a theoretical exercise, but actually try and see it um, for, for what it is in terms of moving forward and making improvements. And yes, there's a theory that's anchored to that. And yes, we're going to learn about that and we're going to apply that um, and, and think about why things develop and why we have contemporary issues in, in education for debate and how that comes from somebody's time to reflect and think, I don't agree with that. 
what do I think? Um, and, and, you know, building up that, under, that broader understanding of reflection. But I think it starts with just that. Look at your reflection. What do you see? Whether that's, um, you know, you could even do it. You could even ask somebody to look at somebody and start reflecting. I see you could, you could have some really good fun as long as you've got good relationships going on there. And then thinking about, um, about what might come next and what the best action might be. Some peer-to-peer -peer reflection, always interesting. Combine the feedback there as well. Lovely, thank you, Thanks, Janet. Helen. Brilliant. Okay, so we are going to move into the second part of the session, but we haven't left reflection behind completely. Please put things into the chat and we'll try and make links throughout uh, this next section related to reflective practice as well. So we all know academic skills are needed to complete the TQ itself and they're going to be vital for the progression of your students onto higher level study. So we're going to break down what is meant by the term academic skills and offer some guidance and ideas related to how the skills could be developed within the context of the technical qualification. So I'm going to ask, to, ask Janet to, to just talk a little bit about academic skills in terms of an education and early years perspective in, in particular, please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know about you, when, but when you first pick up that qualification specification and, and the students will, will find it even more so, it's it can, it can be overwhelming in terms of, you know, wow, look at all of this. I've got to learn this. I've got two years and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So I think the first thing um, that I'd say about reflecting is thinking about what the job role is going to be and thinking about how to get there is, is by actually doing this qualification so I might reflect and think I want to work in education I want to be a teacher I want to be an early years educator where do we want to be and um, and and this qualification is going to help your students to get there and then to break that down and to to think about maybe certain aspects from that certain elements from that that could be part of induction reading and maybe developing you know how are we developing the reading skills how are we developing those shortcuts where we're, we're we're doing the highlighting and we're finding all the key words do people do that with articles and things and and then maybe you know how are we finding the references where are we going for articles what are those academic skills that are helping us to be able to reflect along our journey but always keeping that goal in mind Helen of where we want to be and then always going back you know you might do a skills analysis uh, and think okay what are the what are the gaps in and uh, along this journey and then every, every time you go back maybe termly or something you might do individual learning plans and things like that that's a process of, of reflection and how can that be brought into some kind of formative um, learning within the t-level qualification itself so i'd say we use those skills of reflection in education all of the time um, and I think just bringing it back through the taking stock thinking looking at the at the study skills if you like that are required because this is a qualification that mixes that theory and practice isn't it and 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 it can be very difficult and all the skills that you have to develop to be part of the world of work and to actually achieve and attain as part of a theoretical qualification as well. It's difficult. So I think constant reflection where you can bring the two together um, along the way is, is really important, but practising all of those study skills as you go. And absolutely, Janet, and when I think about academic skills and I think about early years in you know, technical skills, they, they kind of go hand in hand in, in a way as well, because of the, we're going to break down what acad academic skills are um, into their, some of their component parts, not all because mm. there's so much, but I just feel that look, working on these skills that we're going to talk about next are going to help the students in every aspect of their, their life, not just their studies. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think so. It's that we, you've talked about metacognition a few times and, and those higher functioning skills and that that sort of independence and autonomy. And it's it's really important, isn't it, to have to find that drive, to have that motivation, to be able to reflect, to be able to think, right, OK, and have the resilience to think, well, I won't be doing it like that again. I mean, how many times do we say that? Um, but those are, those part and parcel of, of everyday living. You're absolutely right. 
but I think education is so fast moving and these students are going to be working in that environment um, or that's the intention anyway and um, then they need to be prepared for that and they need to be able to think um, to, to think on their feet and, and to be able to to from somewhere develop those skills think okay what do I do this isn't working well what what can I do what are my options and and the quicker they get at that the more able and more confident they will feel um, mm -hmm. because we reflect every time we think every time we imagine we're reflecting aren't we what should I do what should I do we're thinking um, and so are the students and it just needs contextualizing and being brought into into the subject area really Absolutely, absolutely. So we're going to start off as as we normally do with a with a poll just to to gauge starting confidence levels. And the thing about academic skills is that they're not always an area that are, that is actually taught explicitly. Um, and an experience has showed us that not everyone's had the benefit of specific and targeted learning on the subject. So it's it's not just for the students, it's for ourselves as well. So I'm going to launch the, the next poll, asking everybody to do the same one to ten um, choice. So I'm just going to find the right one. If you just bear with me a second. Um, launch, there it is. So same again, developing your students academic skills uh, is part and parcel of the um the whole teaching and learning process how confident do you feel with the topic in general of um academic skills is the next question so if you could um just let let us know what kind of level you put yourself at at the moment please uh, same again it's anonymous this one we don't know who's saying what so um please feel free to be reassured that we're not um, checking individual levels here. It's just getting an overview. I'm just leaving a little while longer just to give everyone the chance to to pop their ideas in. OK, lovely. I'm going to close that now. We've got it. We've got a mixture again. So thank you for that. About where we'd expect. Um, so more or less in the middle ish. Um, I'll never forget when I did one of my teaching calls. It was my numeracy specialism and I was told, advised by my uh, uni tutor to paraphrase my table. So I was like, that sounds like wonderful things that I could do. But what on earth is it? I had to have paraphrasing a table explained to me because meant absolutely nothing and how do we learn these things where do we pick these things up so that's what we're going to look at first but the first thing I'm going to ask you to do um, is to consider what skills are deemed to be academic by defining what is meant by the by the term academic skills or academic literacies they're often called and I'm going to pause for a few seconds to ask you to consider what you think we mean by it um, and put your ideas into the chat, please. There's no poll or anything for this one. So any words, phrases, terms that um, you associate with academic skills, academic literacies um, in general, what? All right, sorry, people have to go for their meetings. No problem at all. Um, so, yes, what, what, what how, how do you? Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Just the odd words. It's great. Get us started. How, how do you define academic skills because I think everybody has a different meaning, has a different understanding, has a different um, opinion and there's nothing right or wrong with them. It's just a case of where where are you at? Jana, what words do you use when you think of academic skills? Well, Helen, you know I don't like the word, so I find it, <laughs> I find it difficult because I think what, what that word does, and this is a good debate really, when we think about academic skills, sometimes that kind of to me creates a barrier between a certain level of of learning and another and I tend to think that actually what makes up learning is is, is all part and parcel and I, I think sometimes academic gives it a level somehow in society we just think oh it's academic and we and and, and it must be, oh, they're it must an be academic. very serious oh they're, oh, they're an academic <laughs> And so I have a bit of a problem with it, but we'll get that out in the open. Um, but if we were thinking about um, 
you know, thinking about it in the context of today in this session, I'd probably say that it was the the theory side of things, the knowledge side of things, the feeling confident with how we were articulating our thoughts. Um, yeah, I, th I think I'd probably define it like that in, and I'd probably be led by my perception of what I think academia is. Yes. So, you know, the reading, the the um, summarising, the analysis and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And what's born, what's been put in the chat there and what we're talking about there, all absolutely oh, I'm valid. not even looking at the chat. Let oh, I see. All <laughs> absolutely valid. But I, I'm going to pull it yes. apart now yes. from yes. all um, of those things. Referencing, oh, I hate referencing. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk through what um, what research and experience has shown me um, that it is. So thank you so much for your ideas so far. You're going to see, well, you've seen on the, on the screen now a couple of definitions and please compare them to what you've been thinking and writing and what, what we've been talking about. The, the first quote there kind of highlights the importance of analysis, although it's American spell and we're going to step away from that. Um, it also talks about comparing and contrasting information from different sources, very important. The second goes on to bring in subject specific texts and how academics use them to contribute to the subject area, the narrative or the discourse about a certain technical or um, specific subject area. Um, they reckon that academics add value to the discussion or discourse about a subject area, bringing in their thoughts and opinions on something. So to me, this suggests that in academia, we don't just accept what is being written or produced. We question it and apply it to a context. And that's in order to allow us to analyse the impact of it and evaluate its relevance and, um, and importance in the sector, in the industry. This next one's from the University of Bristol, where this definition kind of continues further on from the previous ones to talk about how academics use that information gained from the research or reading in their subject area. And that includes, and we're getting to the nitty, nitty gritty now, producing notes, demonstrating an understanding of what's been written and using it in a specific context or for a, for a specific purpose. Because in HE study, what this results in is a student carrying out research, demonstrating their depth and breadth of knowledge on a subject or topic by producing written work, which uses their findings in the correct way to justify an argument or a point whilst evaluating all aspects of that topic from different viewpoints. So there's a lot there to, to go on just in those kind of three quotes. So applying that to students, what I'd like to do now is to ask you what what issues your students bring or might bring of the, the future students um, to their academic studies. So I'm going to give you some um, options in, a, in another poll. So I just have to go back to my team's poll and I'm going to ask you to rate them. Janet, I want you to rate them as well, please. Okay. Um, okay. In relation to the way student the students what are their most prevalent issues? What are the biggest? So what 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 is the biggest issue you find? Put it at the top. And then, the you know, the lowest issue, put it in the bottom. You'll have um, 12 issues there to, to read through and, and sort into highest to lowest kind of thing. So you should see that on your screen now. Janet, can you see it? I can indeed, yes. Brilliant. So I've broken down academic skills into a few different areas there. What kind of issues do your students have first of all is the first question please high biggest issue at the top um rank rate you know rating down to no they don't have anything else but if you choose other because I've, I've put another than there because it's they're your students i don't know what your student issues are if you have any other um things that are more or less you know put in into there please pop the other explanation into the chat so we know what the other thing is so what do they find the hardest to what do they find the easiest top to bottom? Um, how to, where to research, reading questions effectively. So that's in um, in assignment work or in exams. 
uh, writing responses, reading with criticality and writing with criticality, uh, planning work, proofreading, knowing what's expected of them. And that's that's quite quite a biggie. Um, and reading that's and understanding texts, is, it, they're all really high level skills here. They, that, they really are, yeah. Yeah, that 16-year-olds may, may or may not come with. I'm just looking at that second one there on the, on the poll that I'm looking at at the moment, but reading effectively. And in a way, if you unpick that, everything else is falling out of that, isn't it? In terms of reading, I think you mentioned the word purpose, having a purpose. And if we are reading with a purpose, then we're understanding it. Um, we're understanding that that written text and, and perhaps we're able to question something. So, yeah, reading effectively, being able to understand and get those main points um, make judgments and just, you know, out, out of a text can be hard, depending on the complexity of, of the subject area as well. And I think sometimes there's lots of things that are quite complicated that we put in front of our students um, in, 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 any, in any educational stance. And I think if we're trying then to expect a student to read it effectively without really understanding it and spending enough time on it, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to do something at the beginning. And then again at the end to say, right, now read it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what and there are some strategies <laughs> that we're going to talk through in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes that I'll run through that are from an HE perspective, but preparing level three students for HE study and also ready to be at level three, um, that pull that apart a bit, that can structure that way of thinking. So, um, yeah, we've got knowing how to research as the top troublesome thing so we're going to talk about that reading effectively comes in second knowing where to research and reading questions effectively understanding texts and I'm going to talk about different types of text and different types of reading that that we're used to um, reading with criticality and writing responses writing with criticality etc etc so thank you everybody I'm going to close that poll now and I'm going to I was going to say run through everything that we're going to um, talk about here but in relation to teaching and learning strategies as well okay so that's a, a summary of the type of things we've just been talking about there so those are the areas that we're going to talk about a little bit well I'm going to talk about a little bit um, going forward uh, the next question however is I want to pop in with another poll for yourselves um, asking about how 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 do you feel your own confidence level is in related in relation sorry to to teaching all of these subject areas so i'm just going to get another another poll i'm going to put all of those areas into the chat so that you know what they all are and i want you to put into another word cloud um the areas that you feel that you struggle with so just bear with me i'm going to copy them all and pop them into the chat and ask you to use them to tell me or to tell us sorry and um, which areas of them do you feel least confident in please so i've popped the words into the chat i'm just going to go to the poll now um, and just ask you to when i find it there it is uh, launch the right one okay so you should have that on your screen now Mm -hmm. Let me just go back to today's uh, Teams meeting so I can see you all again. OK. So which of those, is that 12, which of the areas or the topics we're going to be talking about do you feel that you're least confident in? Just so I know that I can ensure that I do cover um, them as in as much detail as I, as I need to. I'll just live a little bit longer. Um, I'll just review the results. Lovely. So 
Excellent. We've got some ideas in there. Lovely. Thank you. I'll just leave it a little bit longer before we, we move on to um, my input on these areas. OK, I think that critical reading and writing is um, is absolutely where I'd expect people to to put that there. So thank you for that. Brilliant. OK. I'm going to start off by talking about what it looks like. Um, not in general, but uh, what it looks like in, in practice. And this is just another sort of expansion of what we've talked about so far. And I'm going to talk about these uh, in a bit more detail. So you can see them on the on the screen now um, related to what we're going to talk about but also breaking down the writing, using tone, register, formality, and using their own voice and um, being very explicit about what the expectations are. You know, we talked about knowing what, um, what, what's expected of them. We're gonna, that's what I'm gonna kind of run through. And I've got quite a bit um, here to share with you. So just bear with me for the next 10 minutes or so, and I'll run through everything. Okay, I'm gonna start off with, purposeful reading and that sounds um, quite of an, an odd term um reading with purpose is is absolutely vital if 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 a if a student's going to effectively read critically and um, the the need to have a purpose to read something to to get what they need out of it whether that's electronic or hard copy where to look for appropriate sources and reliable sources is really important um, and if they're using a search engine, which we will be talking about, uh, one which is going to provide the best results and do they know what the best results are? And this also includes how to use key terms and information effectively to, to really inform and guide what to read and what not to read. Uh, then we come on to the author's perspective. It's really important. Um, if it's a book, then what's the purpose of the book? Does it contain hard facts or core knowledge that doesn't change? Alternatively, is it a journal article which provides normally specific information about a specific activity? Is it findings from a research project carried out on a particular context or particular situation and therefore can be really easily challenged or have very different outcomes in an alternative context or situation? Is the text trying to persuade the reader to do something or think in a certain way? These reading skills that I've talked about there are so important when carrying out academic research. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about critical reading. But they can be developed by yourselves using teaching and learning strategies, which are contextualised to you know, the subject area. I'm going to move on to writing now. And the first area I'm going to talk about is the tone of the writing. Do students know what tone to use in their written work? Often prior English learning does not explore this in sufficient detail for higher level study. What level of formality is needed in the, in the tone? How assertive or persuasive should it be? What features make writing more or less formal? And are students able to proofread their own work to ensure they're using the correct tone for the audience and purpose of the document that they're writing or producing? So many questions there, I know I'm really sorry but all vital points for successful academic writing. More about writing is the register, which is directly related to the tone. Often refers to the level of formality in a piece of writing, but in general terms, it means the language being used by a certain group. So in this case, what does academic register mean? Examples could be saying something works, something's effective, or something has the required level of efficacy. And these terms all mean the same thing, but the register of each of them is different. Students need to know if they use the word it works, or it's effective, or it has the required level of efficacy. Each of those are very, very different and used for different purpose. And that can also be linked to reading, because students reading academic reports or texts are going to encounter the examples of the register that they'll need to use in their writing, but also might come across terms which they're unfamiliar with. We've got to be aware that that might disengage them with the reading of the text of the document. So 
Plan to expose your students to as many different examples of different register to build their confidence and knowledge so that they can effectively engage with them when they read them. I'm going to look at formality now in a little bit more detail and generally we're used to informal or chatty and students are definitely more used to informal or chatty language in our everyday communications with each other. So in texts and emails we generally adopt a more informal tone even when we're at work uh, and students should know when this is appropriate and when they should adhere to the conventions of formal writing. Um, for example not using contractions or shortened terms such as I've instead of I have or shouldn't instead of should not. Uh, also formal writing tends to use longer more complex sentences and informal writing uses shorter simpler sentences. Academic writing is more objective, go back to that objective word with um, reflection again, but it also uses more technical language and tends to write from a third person perspective, that's that taking that step out and being the onlooker from outside. So many points to consider here to ensure that the written work is more formal and we will look at some examples of that in the early years context um, later in this session. And then finally is that student voice. In, in academic studies, um, the students must present a clear their own clear, um, clear, clear position on the topic or subject that they're writing about. They must build their ideas into the text resoundingly and successfully in their written work and they'll be required to draw from a range of academic sources and that's to support or discuss their points or claims that they make and in the in the text. Um, there should be a clear distinction between the students thoughts and that's the student voice and the those of other authors the the, the research they've done in the the the, the the feelings, ideas, concepts that they're bringing in from the research. It should be clearly presented, have show a very clear position on the subject or topic, and it should show their knowledge and understanding of it, which is also defended or supported by findings from the research that they've carried out. They might also bring in concepts or evidence from sources which contradict their ideas. This is when you're going up the level in, in terms of analysis and evaluation along with a justification of why they don't consider them to be relevant or useful. So there are therefore already many skills and competencies re related to being academically literate and teachers of vocational technical subjects are in the perfect position to develop these within the specialist area that they deliver. This is because the students are going to engage with them more effectively when developed within the subject that they're studying. Uh, and teachers will see the benefits of students developing these higher order thinking and working skills within their current programme of study. OK, that was a lot. We're going to look at some examples of all of that in practice now. So students are going to need to know how to make the best use of their organisation's library and library services. In our new digital world, the sustainable option is for all library documentation to be digitised. So I'm going to continue with this bit of the session, assuming that students are going to be carrying out their research electronically. And we did talk about where to start the research and that, that is the, that's where we're going to start this section here. So we're going to use a question, something like uh, review reflective practice. Uh, this is why we're going, we're making the links from academic skills back to um, reflection and, and I'm at nine. So some students might simply type that question into a search engine and if they did that using Google it provides over 94 million hits. Not very helpful. Uh, it would be um, quite time consuming to, to pull that apart and find out what's most useful and what for the tasks that they're going to do. So Putting that term into Google Scholar instead gives us just under 5 million hits, so we've re reduced it. And as can be seen on the screen now with the arrows, it also shows that which documents are directly available or readily available from that search. And, and using this more academic website, this Google Scholar, instead of just normal Google, um, it increases the reliability of the documents or content included. It's also got this really good thing where you can 
filter the option to choose date ranges as well. Um, thinking about search terms rather than using the question, if students were to consider the question in a bit more detail and what they want from it, using a different term such as the advantages and disadvantages of reflective practice, this is what they then get on Google Scholar. And this smaller again return um, appears to have a more focused and relevant articles in it, which then can be used by the students to consider a number of different perspectives to help them gather evidence, because we're looking at the advantages and disadvantages of it rather than just reviewing it. Um, it can make it easier for them to target the research, find out specific um, points related to advantages and disadvantages, and they can use that far more effectively to either produce an assignment or highlight any other aven avenues that they might want to explore or take further. So that type of skill or competency is not always explicitly taught. And rather than students developing the knowledge in an unplanned manner, you could get them to compare a Google search to a Google Scholar search uh, and support them in their studies and activities with, with yourselves. Janet, I'm just going to come back to you and say, is there anything specifically to researching element nine or in the sector that you, you could bring in here, please? I think I'm just going to I'm going to reflect and I'm just going to go back to those 12 points. And one of those 12 points um, was about reading critically and about being able to perhaps give your own opinion. And we've talked about that throughout this session in terms of what is somebody saying about something? It's not necessarily something that 100 percent we need to agree with. Perhaps we think, really? You know, we might be we might be reading about John Bowlby and maternal deprivation and think, really, the mother? And so we might have our own opinion there and how we build up those those different views and those different opinions. So I think being able to embrace those discussions and those debates and involve people in that and, and knowing that actually it's OK, what do you what do you think about this will allow for that critical thinking to to develop. So I would say encourage critical thinking. Even by going, even being brave and going into a classroom and saying, Poof, I don't agree with that. I think da, 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 da. what about you? And then being able to 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 bring something um, to bring something back to the table in terms of reflecting. What does this mean to you? Why is it important? And bringing out that student voice, because I think at the beginning of if we're going to call it academic study, we really believe and trust in everything that we read. This has got to be true. This has got to be factual. This has got to be it. As we get older, we realise that actually somebody's always going to contradict that. Somebody's always going to argue and give an opposing view to that. We move on, we learn more and, and we meet somewhere in, in the middle of things. So I think encouraging students to have that voice is, is really, really important. And that is part of that I think that's thinking and we call it with children, we refer to it as sustained shared thinking. I think here we're talking about the context of <clears throat> let's really reflect on that. Is this something that is not necessarily something that we agree with? Let's unpick it. Let's have a think. This is somebody's idea. There's lots of research gone into it. But is that what you think and having those discussions? Absolutely. And it makes me it reminds me of when I first I was first learning about learning theories and I agreed with every single one as, as I was introduced to them. And then I thought, hang on a second, I can't agree with every single one. I have to pull this apart a bit here because it's going to work differently with a different context and a different learner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, that's brought us really nicely onto the author's perspective. So. Students do need to be able to identify and analyse the standpoint of the author. Why have they written the text? How do they feel about the subject? What are they trying to achieve? Students need to be therefore encouraged not to simply accept, like we just said, what is being said in the text by evaluating what's being said and why it's being said. So I encourage the students to actively engage with what they are reading rather than just passively accepting it. So we can structure activities to support the development of that skill. 
by providing, for example, some targeted questions based on that piece of text. You can see some examples on the screen right now. Obviously, these would be tailored to the technical area and the text that, the, that you know that you would provide. So giving them a document and asking them these questions. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with a point made in such and such a paragraph? Could the activity in paragraph four be recreated somewhere else? What would happen if you followed the system or process described on that page or that section of the article? What would you have done in the same situation? Posing these type of questions about the text that the students are reading will really help them to develop their own questioning skills in a structured way. And they could also be asked to produce questions for their fellow students to answer um, or ask and then then be used in the classroom to support and share a more wider um, peer support and peer development situation. So bringing in that question it, give them some targeted questions on a piece of text, but then asking them to create their own questions, which will help them to analyse, do they agree or disagree with any of that? Janet, does that make sense? It absolutely does. And I think sometimes you can bring something in. I've just popped it into the chat there. You can bring something in as, as a hypothesis, can't you? Put a, quest, a question to it and just think, all early years educators must enter the workforce with maths discuss and you can you know we know that's been controversial and we know that now it, it's not it's not required to to work so you don't need your if you've not heard you don't need your GCSE or or, or functional skills in maths from September 24 really really um sort of brave and bold move now there's going to be two um aspects to it there's going to be people who think right that's that's um dampening down oh that's inspiring and motivating. So having things and introducing them and, and being able to, to see things from opposing views. And, and if that's difficult and challenging within a classroom, then you could have some ready-made opposing views and you could do that with, with some theories. I mean, people do it, don't they, with the nature nurture journey and then bring bring those opposing views to an appreciation of, of, uh, of the factors all being interwoven. But it's a way of being able to do that and to think critically about something that we think, now this is written down, this has been written down by an academic, it must, it must be true. There's been years and years of research, it must be true. And of course, it's true to that person, they've proved it in an element of time, but... But what's happened since then and what do you think? So introducing things as a hypothesis would be... It can be really interesting, I think, but you've got to be brave. And if it's if if the classroom becomes difficult, then then do it by having some hard opposing views that you can say, right, you're number one, you're number two, and they're not going to then fall out with each other, but they are going to be the person that they've been asked to represent, as as you say, pretending to be somebody else. Helen, I think was the case study example. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, lovely. absolutely. So we've talked about where to start reading reading with criticality we're moving on to the tone now so we're moving into the the world of writing now and um, so like i said earlier this refers to the way a piece of writing communicates with its readers so in academic writing the tone should be a balance of informal and formal but students may need to ensure that they don't write too formally because that can also disengage a reader so here are some examples of language which could be deemed as being too informal or conversational for academic writing. So students need to be encouraged to use precise wording and specific facts rather than generalisations and limit their use of words which could be deemed as opinionated or ambiguous. Do they know what opinionated or ambiguous language looks like? These words are more are some examples of a more formal tone. Other tips would be to avoid um, the language used typically in public speaking. So, for example, let me explain or as we have seen, as they can be distractive as well. We've got terms that can be distractive in academic writing as well. So it'd be good practice to leave out generalizations and cliches. Also avoid words which express value judgments. For example, wrong or crazy or ridiculous, unless, of course, the students are able to get the point across and it can be backed up. It's not just their standalone 
um, value judgment, if you like. They should also try and um, limit their use of personal pronouns because too many I's and me's can negatively influence credibility of what's being said in the text. And the word you also creates a more casual conversational tone. Could be perfect for a blog, but it wouldn't be the correct tone in a piece of academic text. Janet, I'm going to talk about register and formality before I come back to you again, just so you know. So moving on to register, there are a number of features related to the register of academic writing, and we're going to discuss some of them. Um, and we'll also find that some of the points here related to register map to the general English competencies. So starting with complexity, academic writing has got longer words, tends to be have a more varied language or vocabulary than informal text, and it uses more noun based than verb based phrases getting into the general English there now. It's going to have a higher level, and this was brought in earlier by, um, by one of the attendees, thank you, of grammatical complexity. And I'm going to bring in the terms, it uses more subordinate clauses in complex sentences. In academic writing, it will also contain, contain sorry, precise facts and figures, will be written objectively, there's that word again, and it won't necessarily use a personal tone. Explicit connections should be made between the different sections of the text. They should make links from one paragraph and page and point to the next. It should be very clear to the reader how the parts of the text are related to each other, using vocabulary accurately to ensure there's no ambiguity. And that's where you can bring in punctuation as well. Punctuation should be used to clarify meaning um, and take out any uh, ambiguity. And the writer should be very clear about their stance on the subject. We're going to come to that when it comes to student voice. Um, or the topics, the topics or points that they, may, they make, they must be very clear about and not hedge their bets. No hedging must be going on in their written work. Uh, taking responsibility for what they're writing about is also really important. The writer must be able to produce evidence and justification for any points that they make, whilst also demonstrating an understanding of the source texts that they use. And then finally, academic writing should be very well organised. It should flow easily from one section to the other in a logical fashion. So that's how register impacts on academic writing. And then formality in more detail. So like I said earlier, students don't always differentiate when it's appropriate to use a formal tone and or, uh, to adopt a more formal tone how that contributes to the success and acceptance of that piece of work that, that they're producing or the, what they're saying, um, and how to get the level of formality right for the audience and purpose is absolutely vital in the world of academia. In the world of internet and social media, where our 16, 17 year olds are far more comfortable being, the majority of written text that they'll read is short, snappy, tends to be complicated and easy to access. But we're now asking them to read, engage with and produce very different types of text than they're used to seeing and, and comfortable with. So examples of these with some structured teaching and learning activities could help them increase their skills, knowledge and confidence in how to write formally enough. So. Looking at these examples on the screen now, so students could be asked to consider how these sentences and phrases could be made more formal. There's nothing there that's not grammatically correct or ambiguous, but it doesn't have the proper level of formality to have credibility in an academic context. So asking the students to compare those with the more formal text exa uh, examples you can see now could develop their awareness of the expectations of what higher level study means, they could then revisit their own writing and carry out the same review process. And what you do with this kind of activity would fit in with where their developmental stage is at the time. Um, it was a real shame the guys couldn't repeat the job, very informal. It was rather unfortunate the team were unable to replicate the task. It's kind of says the same thing, but in a very, very different way. So getting students to practice that would be handy. Janet, before I go on to student advice, I'm going to come to you. What are okay. your thoughts? Okay. Well, I think it's a journey. I, I think what we what we've got to do, and um, I'm just I'm just remembering. Sorry, the dogs are joining in with me. 
the level two and the level three students and I, I think level three students level three students on any qualification are on that journey aren't they where they're exploring new knowledge where they are developing their writing skills and I do think to going towards that sophisticated writing is 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 a highly honed skill so I think the the more practice students get absolutely um I think there are some students who will say or will make very few points, but they need to go on this journey with it. And they're, they're writing a lot of information to be able to make and explain the same point um, a little bit with my like my explanation now. And there are other students as they get more sophisticated and they do practice that will be able to be more concise. So I think it's I think it's a journey. I think, yes, the more practice, the better. But some students might find it easier to articulate themselves in a sophisticated way rather than than develop those writing skills. But I do think it is it is a journey and it's one that's picked up again um, at many different points, I think, along a student's um, trajectory. So if it's not something that students are at now, it's where are they? You mentioned developmental stage there, Helen. It's really, really critically important, I think, to, to think, where are my students now? What can I do to help them towards, um, you know, more effective uh, reading, writing and, and being able to summarise and be able to draw and make conclusions and reflect on things in a more sophisticated way. What can I do from that starting point? Um, and having all of these hints and tips, I think, really helps us to think about that sophistication of, 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 of writing, of reading, of making sense of things, of, of giving an opinion and then trying to find somebody else from, from a theoretical world who might agree with that and, and being able to justify your thoughts in that as well all takes time and practice and some students at level three might not get there um, and some students at level three are ready to to run with it straight away so <clears throat> ha knowing your students and tuning into your students just like we do in, in in early years in education vitally important to be able to gauge that and to be able to set that right um, but yeah some great ideas because reflection won't happen um, until we're able to do that and draw upon all of those skills to be able to think about this is where I am, this is where I'm going, this is why, this is how. Absolutely. And I think the students using their own work to do that was is also a good idea. So looking at the, the type of phrases and sentences that they're writing and, and having a bit of a, a peer discussion about, OK, then, if you said we were proper upset, what difference does it make if you said we were extremely disappointed? Is you know is is there any difference um, in relation to how how credible what you're saying is? And it feels like a social class thing, and I can't bear it. No. But it's it's to build their understanding of if they want to be taken seriously, and I said sort of. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I what you mean. I don't I say that with any mean. any happiness. No. Um, no, I know what you mean. It's that sophisticated writing, isn't it? That that is about making your point in a way that's professional, maybe, and that's contextualised. And as professionals, they, you know, we deserve to be valued and listened to. And so, students perhaps need to to develop the skills of that professional practice within within their writing, and 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 that takes time, but professionalism credibility they they go they go hand in hand and we wouldn't yeah. expect to read a report that said she was she was she was proper good at dancing <laughs> but we might say it we might say to the parent uh, you know we might say it but we articulate ourselves and we would write something in a way it's got more meaning when it's written down also, I think, because yeah. that is going to be looked at over and over again. It's not conversational. It's not yeah. informal. It becomes more formal. These are the words that you, you've been referring to, Helen. So I think it's the professional side of it. It's It's got, you're right, it's got nothing to do with class. It's got nothing to do <laughs> um, with, with, with anything like that it, or, or level. It's got something to do with professionalism, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for, for saving me there because I, was, I wasn't I was happy with where I was going, but I was trying to get exactly the point over that you've just made. So thank you. Really appreciate it. 
OK, so the final area now of student voice and the requirements for students to present that clear position on the topic or subject they're writing about, build their ideas resoundingly and successfully in their written work. And we're going to go. I'm going to go back to the question I used earlier about review, the reviewing reflective practice. So on the screen now, it's just a snapshot, uh, a possible example of a student's response to that question and looking at it. It's obvious that they've carried out research on the topic and they're using it to show perspective and ideas on it. But it's not clear to me what the students ideas or thoughts or perspective is. Is there a clear position in this piece of work of what the students position is? Is it? I know it's just a, a snapshot, as I say, it's just a little bit. But do we get any sense of what the student thinks here or believes here? Uh, an activity could be for the students to explore examples of academic work and identify the student voice. What is what is the writer saying in this? Um, and then practice producing written work of their own, which demonstrates their knowledge or understanding of the, of the subject, defended or supported by findings from the research that in research that they've carried out. And then they might also bring in concepts of evidence, like I said earlier, from sources that contradict their ideas, um, along with why they don't consider them to be relevant, but it just shows that higher level of analytical skills at the same time. Janet, any thoughts on, on the student voice section? I think it's sort of bringing together everything that you've talked about um, really Helen I think being able to to have that voice being able to think about something being feeling comfortable so creating that environment in the classroom where, where you can have those debates where you can have those discussions where you can reflect where things are unpicked and 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 sort of looked at from different perspectives I think it's it's all really relevant to to this, but I think rather than just teaching a reflective model and thinking, right, OK, you know, um, we've we've got to look at, at, at um, Cobb, we've got to look at Walker and Bow, we've got to look at Kia, rather than just thinking about something as a theoretical model of reflection. I think somebody mentioned right at the very beginning, putting putting the student in that, thinking about where they fit in that and bringing their practice, maybe using their placement as an example i think it's being part of it through actively engaging um it's it says there at the bottom for example and i think that's really important because we can learn theoretical models but we we don't necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean anything to us and it won't mean and it means something even less uh, far removed for for a student uh, um, of 16 who's looking at, at these things and thinking you know it's a theoretical model it's not real it's it, it's something that somebody it's wrote something about. it's an abstract <laughs> yes exactly it's, it's not real so I, th I, th I think that the more that students can can reflect and can think and can share and I think the key to that is right at the very beginning we talked about relationships and the the idea I think it came up when you when you were talking about being able to give and, and, and receive feedback the idea of feeling safe and comfortable and trusting that you're actually going to be you know that inclusive nurturing environment where 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 the students where all students are going to feel confident giving their opinion so important for reflection it is and the, the classroom is the safe space for them to 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 give that opinion isn't it so it's, absolutely it's, yeah it's the ideal place to to do that and i'm just reading back through this um all of the points are, are valid um and this you know this makes links to teachers of the future and how how reflection is, is so important and then but also how reflection makes students more aware of their own performance but even pulling apart the dates we've got 2018 and then back to 2004 and 2004 hasn't seen that long ago but you know it's 20 years next next year since 2004 so um it's it's an interesting in concept there's lots of other things that we can pull apart here and we've covered nine areas sorry six areas um in a bit of detail but there's so much more as well um so yeah and i've just put into the chat again there just to remind people to uh, put anything comments questions in the chat please as we go so 
Just going to summarise these six areas. They've got many different factors and they contribute to student success, all of these areas that we've got on the screen now. And breaking down those factors and the other factors that we haven't had time to cover today into their component parts will, will help the students to understand expectations of them, requirements. And if we as teachers explicitly teach them to raise the students awareness of what they are, it will help them to develop the skills, knowledge and confidence for future academic success. So we're going to move on to the last Jamboard uh, activity where we're asking you to share your top tips for supporting and developing your students academic skills. So I'm going to bring the the uh, Jamboard back up because it's on. It's on here, it's on this last page here. So yeah, as I say, we're asking you to what are your top tips for helping your students, support your students develop their academic skills, um, reading, writing, researching, anything we've talked about and anything we've not talked about. It does, it does and can feel like a big hill. Um, and especially when we're technical teachers and we're not necessarily academics ourselves. But then again, what is an academic? What, you know, what, what is an academic? Because to me, if you've got technical skills, regardless of the level you're educated to. Um, these these skills are there. We just don't acknowledge them and we don't badge them. I'm an academic. Uh, it's it's just odd, isn't it? The whole the whole attitude towards what is academic and what isn't. <sighs> yes, I think if we see it as learning, so it's a continuum, and sometimes there are difficult parts on that continuum but we're moving all the time and, and sometimes we have to move back to move forward and and it, and I think it's it's just accepting that but I think everybody will be on this journey at different at different levels but, but there'll be an improvement in the way that students are synthesizing information along this journey for some it'll mean that they're able to research and analyze and evaluate and for others it'll just mean i can go to where i need to go and find the information that i need and i can bring it forward into a piece of writing that might not be sophisticated but that makes sense in the context and i think it's it's that really and and the that, that sophisticated writing is sometimes something that that our students aspire to rather than attain um, and I think that's okay that as long as we're on that journey and we're seeing some steps going forward that because I agree it, it I don't want it to feel like a hill I want it to feel like um, maybe some ups and downs and meandering along the way but 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 something that's hard to climb puts us off so don't don't want that but a continuum, def definitely. And and that what we've talked about today might be something that is not going to be within everybody, within every student's reach, but getting better at those things definitely is. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And it's um, anybody can be an academic. I mean, I've just put a, a, a post-it note on there about applying theory to practice and how hard that is it's and that's 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 the good thing about the t-level it's about applying all that theory to practice and that's that's the the biggest academic skill that i can that i can think of when you're actually able to apply it in the workplace and you don't just have it as as knowledge that you don't necessarily apply Yes, and, and thinking about, you know, if, if students even stop and think about what what they're doing, what 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 they're what they're reading, what they're um how their practice is, I think just thinking is is sophistication in itself. Yeah. I'm just we're having problems oh, with the jamboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah. Um, so yeah, just asking asking Sarah to tell us if she wants us to add anything on here that we absolutely okay. absolutely can. Um, oh, love that. So I'm just going to copy that from Sarah's. Um, yes, brilliant. Yeah, get them going is is, is absolutely the right way to go. Giving them yeah. extracts, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And different different 
viewpoints, different theories, contradicting theories, opposing theories, you know, really get that rich discussion going um, and getting them to take those theories to their placement and applying them and talking about them in in, in the placement is um, is also really good. So, so yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. OK, so I have included the references that I used in that student voice bit. Um, it's not Harvard references. You can see they're just a list of links and we haven't even discussed which referencing system to use. Obviously, that's dependent on the individual and all, yeah, yeah, organizational prefer preferences. But if you haven't used Google Scholar or you don't use it, another bonus of using it is it does provide clear information about how to cite sources using, I think it's about five or six different systems, Harvard being one of them. Um, and that obviously then uh, saves the students time um, in relation to if they are going to Harvard reference anything, teach them that in Google Scholar it's there ready for them, which is really easy. Uh, and we'll like easiness as much as possible. The next slide, I'm going to ask about your confidence level and how, how, if at all, has it changed and in today's two topics. So I'm just waiting for it to load. Now, again, it's um, it's anonymous, so please, um, please do not worry that we'll we'll see results. We don't, but it's not a scaling now at all. It's um, has your confidence level changed at all? regarding today's topic. So not at all, improved a little, improved a medium, improved a lot, or has it consolidated what you already knew, which is, um, or already thought or already did, which is just as relevant and just as um, important for us to know. So please let us know, has your confidence level changed at all? Um, and we'll just let these Brilliant. Everyone's improved. So that's wonderful. Eve, and then it's not just a little. So that's I mean, I'm so happy. I am so happy. Um, but in, in terms of teaching and learning, please talk to us in, in the PVD team and talk to Janet about, you know, how do we raise uh, academic skills? Can we recommend any particular uh, journal articles, books, etc.? And I know Books, I mean, I was always told books go out of date as soon as they're published. In fact, before they're published, the, the concepts and theories can be out of date straight away. So bringing in journal articles instead, talking about the difference between a book and a journal article. Um, and normally journal articles being research papers that are, are targeted on a specific area, specific topic, topic area of the country, area of the world um, type of person that the research has done on etc etc so there's lots there that um you can bring in just in in conversation kind of thing uh, i'm just going to remind you again that we're still asking if you've got any questions please pop them in the chat i know we've talked about so much so much today uh no questions a silly question please this is a safe space um to ask for confirmation clarification anything we've spoken about today um, please pop it in the chat. That's it's what we're here for. So absolutely. OK, please put them in the chat. So we've got the provider development email address there. If you've got any questions, you, you know our email addresses if you're already in contact with us. Um, there's also the link there to, to the future events. We're going to promote our assessor network that's starting in December. So, so excited. And this has come from the EQA team themselves wanting to support providers in relation to the, um, the moderated occupational specialism assignments. We're going to be sharing best practice. We've got going to have a couple of sign, sound bites from providers who have done very well in the occupational specialisms. So getting the chance to hear what they do, but also ask questions about what they do. Um, please have a look at the the events webinar section of the hub. Just going to go back to the chat, Janet. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you think we should have mentioned today? I don't think so. I think we've. I think Helen, the the topic of reflection and the hints and tips around that, and the components that make up reflection, and therefore part and parcel of element nine, um, have all been touched upon. And I think it's as always being student centric, thinking about where those students are, looking 
and encouraging student contribution and participation um, and making sure that small steps and um, towards that and um, you know towards that that professional early years educator or teaching assistant in the terms of this particular T level um, is, is taking place so always bringing it back to where do you want to be where are you going and what does that look like and constantly then reflecting on on that journey and if you can get that model going then you've got a you, you've got a professional sophisticated approach to to uh, reflection and development absolutely yeah thank you um thank you sarah thank you charlene i've popped a um evaluation form into the chat a link to a microsoft form we're always looking to uh, evaluate what we do and improve what we do and make sure that what we do is what you want us to do. So um, as I say, there's an evaluation form in the chat there. If you get just a minute as you before you go to to fill that in for us so that we can uh, action anything that we we could do differently or or better. Um, thank you. That was best part of two hours of a lot of listening. So I really thank you for your patience and listening to us. Um, hopefully you have found it interesting and, and feedback so far is, is that you have found it useful and interesting. Um, thank you for your time. If you want to stay, please stay and ask questions. Um, but we're, we're at the end of the session now. So thanks again. Please work with us further. that way. It was so, so keen to, to support your T-level journey. So, so thank you. Thank you.